My name is Michael DeMarco, and this is the first in a series of podcasts that will discuss artistic works in the depth that brevity allows. My bachelor's degree is in economics from Connecticut College in New London, and I am now a civil litigation attorney practicing in Greater Boston, Massachusetts. From 2013 until 2016, I researched and wrote a work of historical fiction uh, entitled Redemption Lost, set in the 17th century and named in homage of the great epic poem that John Milton published in 1667. Paradise Lost. In the process of writing this book, I found myself drawn uh, not only to Milton, but other writers and artists of the 17th century and beyond. Uh, This series of podcasts will offer my own interpretation of Paradise Lost, which is the best work of English language literature that I've ever read. Now, there are problems with interpreting any work of literature, namely, uh, first, the impossibility of fully comprehending the historical context in which it was written. Secondly, the message we seek to extract from it from the outset, and our ability to accommodate it into our own opinions. And lastly, that no writer is perfect, and therefore they are certain to have included things that do not comport with their overall point. So regarding this last point, I I hope to present an analysis that is devoid of abstract academic vocabulary that, even at its best, does little more than grant an undeserved veil of complexity to an otherwise unsophisticated commentary. So if, if you're someone who hates bullshit, consider that it is bullshit that has ruined our ability to appreciate the arts, and let me, in all modesty and with no coercive dross, pray that this podcast is for you. So let's begin. Book one of Paradise Lost. Uh, The opening invocation of this poem appeals to a Christian muse, and Milton vows to soar above the Aeonian Mount, by which he means he will exceed the prestige of Homer. Um, And his purpose, he says, is his intention to justify the ways of God to men. Uh, The story itself begins with Satan in hell, having recently fallen from heaven. He briefly consults with Beelzebub, his second in command, before mustering his legions together and calling for a great consultation. Not much else takes place in book one. Uh, I am interested in Milton's classical influences for the purpose of this first podcast. Specifically, I'd like to talk about Homer's Iliad and Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound. Uh, The Iliad, of course, is an epic poem in ancient Greek that narrates events in the Trojan War just prior to the death of Achilles and the capture of the city. Uh, Prometheus Bound is a play by Aeschylus in which Prometheus has famously given fire to man and is suffering his punishment in chains. And those are adamantine chains, much like the adamantine that exists in Milton's Hell. Um, And in the Greek Trojan War, nine days worth of arrows have rained down on the Greeks just after their defiance of Apollo, much like Satan and his demons took nine days to fall from heaven into hell. Uh, In Prometheus Bound, um, the Titan is suffering his punishment in chains on a lonely perch where he proclaims that the path to his eventual freedom will be after a strategy of guile and deceit. And when the messenger god Hermes is dispatched by Zeus to learn what the Titan might mean, Uh, Prometheus is doomed to worse torments, and the play ends with his descent into the earth where a bird will peck his innards. The name of Milton's poem seems to be syntactically inspired by Aeschylus. Prometheus bound. Paradise lost. The following motifs seem to link all of these works, that is, the Iliad, Prometheus bound, and Paradise lost. One, the frustration of reason in the face of a physically supreme foe. Two, that it is guile or deceit that will grant vengeance. And three, and this is kind of the big one for me, the idea of mankind's incentive to elevate himself, both materialistically and scientifically, is indebted to divine meddling. Now, I pose this question. Is it possible 
that Milton is not adverse to the interpretation that, in a sense, Satan rescued us from the Garden of Eden, rescued us from a naked, subsistent lifestyle that even in total ignorance and innocence was insufficient gratification and appertained to an unfulfilled existence. If true, then Milton's Satan shares a place in mythology with the story of Prometheus. And then I think even if what I have just posited is a little bit of a stretch, I think it is somewhat easy to show that there is a Promethean element to the story of Milton's Satan, and that his story in Deceiving Eve into Eating from the Fruit can be likened to the pursuit of knowledge, to the implantation of a desire for knowledge that is similar to Prometheus's gift of fire. And there's a certain irony, I think, that the classical influences can be so easily felt when Milton has stated in the opening lines that it is, it is his intention to soar over the Ionian Mount. Now, it's quite clear he's not soaring over the mount. He is climbing over it. He, he is relying on the um, he is relying on the old epic poems almost as a template, which is why I kind of want to get into the structure of it. Wh where he chooses to begin this is very Greek, in that he's beginning in the middle, and he is be he is beginning at a position in the narrative in which the act of defiance has already taken place. In Book One of Paradise Lost, we find Satan having already rebelled against God, and he has already fallen. He has already felt the folly of his defiance. In the beginning of the Iliad, we begin, first of all, in the middle of the Trojan War. Um, the Trojan War has, has been waged for, about, for 10 years. We also begin with an act of defiance against the gods, this being Agamemnon's um, defiance of the god Apollo. Um, in the beginning of Prometheus Bound, we begin after the act of defiance has already taken place. Prometheus has already given fire to man, and he is being punished for it. Prometheus Bound opens with the Titan being led to a rock by an entity that would have taken, you know, would have been a person acting on stage, but the, their character was merely strength. So there's a character in Prometheus Bound that is strength personified. And strength is prodding on Hephaestus, the god of the forge, to nail Prometheus to the rock where he is not going to be able to move. I think it is significant that Aeschylus, the translation that I have, uses the word crucified. And I think that's interesting, that Prometheus is being crucified to a rock. And he's doing this for mankind. He considers it to have been an act of goodwill, goodwill to give fire um, to mankind. So right off the bat, Milton made a decision to start in the middle of the story. And I, I find that to be very much in keeping with the structure um, of the old epic poems. It's not like he is going to continue in chronological order from now on. He is going to circle back and tell us what has already happened. He is going to describe to us um, the, the war in heaven. We're going to hear all about it. We're going to hear all about Satan's arguments later, but that's not where he's starting. But what, what I really want to talk about is the metaphor that is Prometheus's fire. He, he takes credit for giving fire to men, and he explains why he did as, as an act of kindness. Um, but let's look at some of the things he says. Because he, he, he explains his gift as being the originator of other advancements that, man, that, man have made, that men have made technologically. Um, and he describes the state of man before he gave them fire. These are some of the things he says. At first, mindless, I gave them mind and reason, he says. In those days they had eyes, but sight was meaningless. Heard sounds, but could not listen. All their length of life they passed like shapes in dreams, confused and purposeless. This is him explaining man before, the, before fire came to them. I taught them to determine when stars 
rise or set, a difficult, a difficult art, number, the primary science, I invented for them. These are all the things that Prometheus is taking credit for. So when we think, when it, in Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound, the gift of fire, it's a, it's a bit metaphorical. You know, we're not supposed to imagine that Prometheus went into a cave and found a bunch of half-human, half-monkeys and said, hey, you know, hey guys, get over here and, and knock these rocks together. The idea is that he planted it in their heads to be, to be clever, to figure out how to do things, to have a little bit of ingenuity. Um, and I think his description of the way that men lived prior to the gift of fire has its easy comparison to be made with the state of pre-fallen man. Is there a comparison to be made between Prometheus's gift of fire and Satan's um, deceit of Eve into eating from the fruit? This seems easy enough. But what, what, but what do we think Milton is therefore saying? It's one thing to associate the eating of the fruit with original sin. To me, it's quite another thing to associate it with an, with an imparting of man's ingenuity along with man's inherent fallibility, our inherent sinfulness. In Aeschylus, this question is not a big deal because Prometheus is not an inherently negative figure. P Prometheus is, is seen as an ally to mankind. He is not demonic. Satan is. So for John Milton to turn around and draw a link between Satan and Prometheus, to me, that's a bold statement. That's a bold statement if Milton is indeed trying to suggest to us that's not just our, our sinfulness. It's our resourcefulness, our ingenuity, our desire to make progress, our desire to have a civilization, all are things that we, that we owe to Satan. Is Milton saying this? Is he? He certainly doesn't state it directly. But let's make the argument that that is exactly what Milton's saying. So at the end of book one, Milton, after a brief conversation with Beelzebub, however you pronounce that name, Satan calls all of his legions, and there's, it's very vividly described, all the demons in hell, captains of legions, are assembled for Satan to address them. This, by the way, has its parallel in the Iliad. Book two of the Iliad is a roll call, and that's pretty much it. It is Homer itemizing the list of the Greek captains exactly the way that Milton gives us the names of Satan's captains. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm not gonna name them all, um, but I. The certain things to me are interesting. Osiris and Isis, two Egyptian gods, they're there. They are on the plane of hell. He also s tells us that the Greek gods are there. He calls them kind of the sons of, of Job. And he doesn't, go, he doesn't go into them. And he doesn't name them specifically. But he suggests that they're not, they're not even a big deal. He tells us that the reason he doesn't tell us their names, they're not important enough. These are the, those, you know, Zeus, Apollo, all those are, those are low ranking demons that, that those, those Greeks worshiped. And I think there's an interesting part later on. Um, there's a specific um, demon, Mammon. Um, and after this sort of, you know, chin whack, they notice that there are precious metals in hell. Although Milton urges us to remember not to admire that riches grow in hell. Don't don't admire that. Don't admire their the vast wealth of Satan and his legions. But then talking about Mammon, he says, by him first, men also, and by his suggestion taught ransacked the center, that is the, he means the center of the earth, and with impious hands rifled the bowels of her mother earth for better treasures hid. Soon had his crew opened into the hill a spacious wound and digged out ribs 
of gold. Let none admire that riches grow in hell. This is, this is Milton talking. By his suggestion taught, by Mammon's suggestion, men were taught to fish through the earth looking for precious metals. And, he, and Milton goes on to describe um, the history of mankind, the history of civilization, and indicating to us that all these things were actually the work of Satan. The Tower of Babel was built and led on um, by Satan's demons. That the Greek civilization, is they're, they're worshiping Satan's demons. The Egyptians. Th this, is, this is Milton laying all of the accomplishments prior to the arrival of Christianity at the foot of Satan. That, that seems to me to be a pretty bold statement. And I think he's taking it further than his contemporaries would have taken it. Even his most devout contemporaries, I don't think would have gone so far as to suggest that I think they would have said Apollo is just a made up person. I don't think they would have gone so far as to say that Satan himself or his underlings planted the idea to go fish for gold and the, and the, the idea of having elaborate temples being built. And he talks about these. In Paradise Lost, Milton talks about these temples. And he talks, he talks about these uh, ornate buildings with their Doric columns and their golden architraves. And he describes them quite vividly while simultaneously telling us, don't, don't be impressed by this. You know, this is for I, I, idolaters. Don't be impressed. So I think this is a very bold statement made by Milton. And I do, th I do think he's drawing this comparison. He is suggesting that we are in Satan's debt for our ingenuity. However, what is interesting to me is for us to question how serious Milton is. I think that's what he's saying, but how seriously is he saying it? How seriously is he making this point? Or is this a sarcastic mechanism for him? And I am going to define Miltonian sarcasm in the following two ways. The first one, to summarily dismiss an otherwise well-made argument in condemning terms. Or two, to concede the most crucial factual prong in an opposing argument and then proceeding to make an untenable and dubious counter conclusion, the sincerity of which we strongly doubt. As applied in this case here, Milton is daring us to concede the fact that if it were up to God, we would still be picking fruit naked in the Garden of Eden. And that if it hadn't been for Satan tricking us into eating the fruit, that there would have been no Parthenon, there would have been no Forum, there would have been no civilization, and that we are meant to concede all of these things, and we are to esteem God anyway, and deem his ways justified.